The first speaker uh, is Dr. Lydia Moreska. Um, and as I said earlier, it, it was my great pleasure to watch Dr. Moreska uh, present at the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygiene many years ago. Um, anyway, um, uh, Professor Moreska is a professor at Queensland University of Technology and director of the International Laboratory for Air Quality and Health. She was co-author of It's Time to Address Airborne Transmission of COVID-19, which was signed by 239 international scientists. And I believe that open letter was, um, was sent to the World Health Organization, um, you know, as a kind of like a bit of an impetus to, to get them to acknowledge that the coronavirus is, is, is airborne as well. So we need to think about the airborne uh, transmission route. But uh, Dr. Uh, Marowska's um, title of her talk is, why should we get serious about airborne transmission in schools? Which is sort of along the line of our theme at the moment um, with regards to, to school reopening. So um, I, I will now hand you over to uh, Professor Marowska. And thank you so much, Professor Marowska, for offering to present today. Thank you very much, Kevin, for your introduction, uh, and thank you for inviting me. First, I will share my screen. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Well, good morning, everyone from Brisbane. Uh, it is a bright, sunny spring morning uh, here today. Uh, thanks again for having me on this talk, um, which I structured uh, around a few points. I'll say a few words about the source, human respiratory activities, particles in the air and uh, risk of infection, outbreaks and airborne transmission, and why should we get serious? But before I do this, I'll say a few words about definitions, which have been a topic of uh, many uh, arguments, contention, and so on. Well, in aerosol science, that's where I belong, um, aerosol is an assembly of liquid or solid particles suspended in a gaseous medium long enough to enable observation or measurement. And droplet is a liquid particle, which means it doesn't have anything to do with size. So whether it's aerosol, smaller, bigger, uh, it is just composition. Droplet is a liquid particle. But um, uh, medicals or in medical profession, medical sciences, this is seen quite differently. And aerosol uh, are smaller particles and droplets are larger particles. This has attracted a lot of uh, arguments um, at the beginning. Uh, but my approach to this now is let's don't worry about this the differences. We won't teach each other what's what and doesn't matter really as long as we understand what we are talking about. I tend to uh, call these objects particles to avoid any uh, confusion. The source. The source are our respiratory activi activities and particles atomized during uh, these activities. Our res respiratory tract, and as uh, most of you know very well, is very complex, and therefore there, is, um, uh, there are many sites where aerosols uh, particles can be generated, starting uh, from the uh, lower parts um, here in bronchioli. What happens is that if we exhale, blockages form, and then uh, they burst uh, during subsequent inhalation, and as a result, particles are generated. So this is here. Then in the um, slightly upper part, in the larynx, uh, where there's plenty of fluid, particles are aerosol, uh, aerosolized during voicing, uh, any vocal activities. And uh, finally, in the mouth, saliva is aerosolized during interactions with tongue, teeth, uh, lips, during um, speaking. I often say that what's happening in the respiratory tract is similar to what's happened in a nebulizer or an um, old-fashioned perfume bottle like this. It is just much more complicated because of this um, many sites where particles can be generated. And because of this, because of this complexity of the generation process, the size distribution of the particles is quite complex. Um, this slide will be quite busy, so I'll show it step by step. This is a size distribution of particles during speaking and breathing. First of all, you'll see that uh, we are using logarithmic uh, horizontal scale, and you can see that uh, the size distribution has several peaks. 
The most important, however, aspect is that the majority of the particles are small. So you can see them here up to about 10 micrometers where the uh, majority of them is. And there are also particles below one micrometer. Our experimental design didn't allow us to measure particles in this size range. The uh, different peaks result from different respiratory activities, as I just mentioned. So this smallest one and extending to the lowest micrometer is the uh, fluid burst during um, inhalation and exhalation. This is the particle smaller. Interestingly, uh, this is where it's considered to be the source of this particular pathogen, H5N1. So it's very important that it's not only the question where the particle uh, originates from, but also what lives in this part, if I can say it this way, of the respiratory tract. If there are pathogens there, they are aerosolized uh, during these activities. The second uh, mode is uh, slightly bigger particles, are uh, uh, laryngeal vibration mode and the, uh, the biggest one, oral speech uh, articulation. And here it's considered that this is the source of uh, H1N1. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, where is the virus, uh, these big particles uh, are, uh, well, because they are big, uh, some considered that that's, uh, they contain a lot of uh, more virus than the other particles. But in fact, this is not the case. Studies uh, find that the highest viral load is in the smallest particles. As I said, we didn't measure this, but there are particles here. And for, for example, this study by uh, Joshua Santarpia and colleagues showed that that's where the majority of the virus was. So this is the source, um, uh, what's generated. And as I said, it's important to remember that the particles are small and there are lots of them. There's the concentration of the particles during different respiratory activities. This slide is from our study uh, where we investigated uh, several different types of respiratory activities, breathing, nose, mouth, counting, voice, whisper, uh, which are presented here on the horizontal axis and then concentration on the vertical axis. You can see that all these respiratory activities uh, generate particles, but uh, concentrations during uh, breathing, whether nose or mouth, are much smaller than during vocalization. This is, voca this is close to singing. Uh, uh, these concentrations are higher than even during coughing. Uh, not only our study uh, showed this, there have been other, uh, other studies, uh, for example, this study uh, by uh, Asadi recently published, showing that different uh, breathing activities generate much less particles than uh, speaking. So this is um, the concentration, the source. The question now could be, since we are talking about the schools, about children, are children as a, a source? Uh, there have been lots of discussion about this uh, and lots of hypotheses why they are apparently as smaller transmitters. Uh, with um, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Michael, we've, uh, we've uh, put one of these hypotheses uh, as published in this paper. Uh, well, what we suggested is that compared to adults, children uh, have fewer uh, alveoli and terminal bronchioli and therefore less sites for a particle formation where virus um, could be um, uh, residing and they have also lower respiratory minute, minute volume and tend to have lower viral loads. So these are hypotheses, there have been other hypotheses uh, as well, but very importantly, a uh, number of children, for example, tested positive for COVID uh, just in the United States is half a million. Case fatality is not as high as in adults, but their children also dying. Uh, in particular, in Indonesia seem to, to be much higher, 1.1%. In China, Italy, and US is uh, an order of magnitude lower. So children are a source of, um, uh, of um, um, SARS uh, COVID-2, and therefore the discussion about the school is, of course, very relevant. So now a few uh, words about particle fate in the air and the infection risk. Here is a figure from our uh, paper, which uh, Kevin uh, mentioned, and uh, 
um, there are several uh, core signatories on the call here right now. What happened to the particles? Well, the particles um, that generated during respiratory activities are small enough, as I've pointed out, and therefore they suspended in the air for a long time, certainly a sufficiently long time, which is relevant to residency in uh, indoor spaces, public spaces, which we share. This is presented here on the upper um, uh, panel where you can see this particle simply stay in the air uh, from the uh, uh, infected person and inhaled by other people. So they stay in the air for a long time unless they are removed from the air by ventilation, like in this panel here, and other pro pro uh, par uh, processes which I put in lower, in smaller font, because of course other processes are um, taking part as well. But in dynamic situations uh, in public places, the ventilation, removal by ventilation is uh, a, a, the most important process. So they stay in the air and they uh, create risk. Uh, risk assessment uh, has been conducted for a long time. This is not something new, something which um, ideas which uh, were developed during this pandemic. In uh, one of our pa uh, papers published um, years ago, we've assessed a uh, uh, relationship between ventilation and infection risk for three virus, for uh, three pathogens, rhinovirus, influenza, and tuberculosis. And we did this simulation for, a, for the lung function laboratory in the Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane for uh, occupancy of um, 15 and 45 minutes uh, using the very well established uh, model for doing this, Wells Riley uh, model and this um, specific quanta uh, well known for or reasonably well known for uh, uh, influenza, tuber uh, tuberculosis and rhinovirus. So what you can see here that uh, uh, with the increase of outdoor exchange per hour, infection risk decreases. And again, this is logarithmic scale and it depends on the quanta for specific um, uh, pathogens. So this kind of analysis and risk assessment uh, have been already done and can be done. So this brings me to the outbreaks and airborne transmission. Well, we can't say that airborne transmission is the only pathway of transmission, but all three, so all three modes of transmission can occur and do occur and are important. However, airborne is significant little is done about this and more and more studies we have during uh, this pandemic show that it is perhaps the most significant mode. I'll just give two examples here. This is the Skagit Valley uh, choir practice. Uh, the importance of this is that this practice happened when uh, already the risks were known and the participants already practice uh, social distancing, uh, disinfection and uh, other recommended measures. So um, this would be very difficult to say that uh, the other modes were equally important because uh, there were no recommendations obeyed. Uh, we did um, several assessments of this and this uh, particular slide is from our recently uh, published or accepted uh, paper where we uh, calculated the um, quanta concentration and probability of infection based on the assumed quanta, uh, uh, infectious quanta and for time in this diagram is up to um, 60 minutes. So we've got the, uh, the the curve here for quanta concentration, which is gradually leveling, uh, leveling off and increased uh, risk. Uh, the, the model showed um, a very good um, relation between what actually occurred during this practice. Uh, we've developed uh, what we called airborne infection risk tool, which is based on this model, which I mentioned uh, a little while ago, used in the hospital in Brisbane, but more complex to uh, use also the uh, quanta emitted during specific uh, respiratory activities and few other uh, elements and factors to make it uh, more um, or precise if I could say it this way. Anyway, this uh, modeling uh, points out that airborne transmission in this particular case was the dominant factor. This is a, an example of very different uh, type of assessment. 
during and uh, this is for uh, assess what happened during the uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship um, uh, outbreak, uh, which I'm sure everybody, uh, everyone has heard about. A paper bus by Azimi and colleagues. Now, what we can see here is um, transmission mode and viral sort. For the transmission mode, uh, the authors looked at uh, short range and long range and fomites. Now, by short range, um, what we considered both droplets and, well, they call it aerosols, for long range only aerosols, and the estimation, uh, uh, estimated infection contribution. So, what we can see, of course, there are uh, this. Um, um, uh, this uh, the bars here, but we can see that long range, which aerosols, uh, seems to be larger than short range, which is droplet and aerosols, and aerosols uh, in terms of viral cells is more significant. Now, this um, kind of uh, estimates are only estimates based on different models. They cannot be precise because uh, we can never do uh, prospective studies of outbreaks. Well, if we could do this, there wouldn't be outbreaks. So therefore, there's always a question mark uh, whether we have all the data and whether all the data are uh, of um, sufficiently good quality. But it's not just this two uh, analysis and assessment have been done. Many more as well pointed out to pointing out to the airborne transmission. Schools are a good settings for outbreaks because of the number of uh, people uh, and the time they spend uh, in indoor uh, air, uh, air of the class in classrooms sharing indoor air just think about the frequency of colds and flu in schools so why do you need why do we need to get serious about uh, airborne covid-19 transmission in schools because this emerges as the most significant mode of transmission in many settings, as I uh, showed. Infected people exhale particles that stay in the air. Susceptible people inhale them and can, uh, can get infected. The crowded situations in schools provides a perfect environment for outbreaks. Just think that one infected child can share the virus with, uh, through the air with the whole class and the teacher. One infected child will not necessarily directly interact with all the classmates, touching them with their hands contaminated. So this is another kind of common sense approach to thinking about this. Why we are talking about this, and I want to stress this very strongly, this is not about keeping schools closed indefinitely because of the risk of airborne transmission as, as uh, many think, but about reducing the risk as much as possible. If we understand the risk, we can reduce this. This is not something which is going to happen from one day to another. We haven't done anything about this or very little for a very long time. It is time to change paradigm, how we approach uh, airborne transmission of infections in general. But it's time to do it now and get serious about this. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mareska. And um, this is a really important um, um, topic. And many of us are very passionate about um, this, especially as you know, we have children that are, are going back to school. So it's really timely that we talk about this now. Um, uh, and I will hold questions off. And what I will say, though, is if you do have questions, please put them in the chat box. And there are many uh, people on the line that can also answer some of the questions. And I just noted um, that Tony Havocs answered the question about um, 56 air changes per hour being, you know, kind of a bit sort of crazy anyway. Just, um, <laughs> so please um, contribute answers to questions as you see them um, there. Um, so the next speaker um, is um, Dr. Joseph Allen. And, the Harvard guidance um, on, on, on reopening schools, the, the Harvard guidance information is really fabulous. Um, and we've been trying to promote that as much as we can because there's so much good information in there about ventilation. It really it does get people thinking about ventilation. So um, just on that, I'd like to in, uh, welcome Dr. Joseph Allen, Allen, who is the Director of Healthy Buildings Program at the Harvard T.H. Chan School 
of Public Health, his program has produced numerous guidance on COVID-19, including reopening schools. And um, so uh, Dr. Allen's uh, title is Risk Reduction Strategies for Reopening Schools. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Allen. Over to you. Great. Yeah. And uh, hello, everyone. And, and it's a pleasure to uh, be here with you. And uh, I just want to thank Lydia for her leadership, because uh, I think our entire fields have been uh, talking about airborne transmission for many months, but it took her leadership with Don to bring us all together with one voice. And that really led to the conversation changing. Uh, so thank you for that. That was a brilliant piece of leadership. Appreciate it. Uh, I run the Healthy Buildings Program at the Harvard School of Public Health. Relevant to this conversation is uh, my background is in exposure and risk science. I'm a certified industrial hygienist, so I do a lot of work on worker health and safety. And outside of Harvard, I've done forensic investigations of sick buildings for over a decade. And so in a lot of ways, uh, have, have, uh, there's a lot of aspects of this pandemic that feel quite familiar, meaning uh, we know how to assess hazards in the workplace and implement controls, be it radiological hazards, chemical hazards, or biological hazards, and across a range of biological hazards. So we've been doing this for a long time, advising many different organizations. I'm a commissioner on the Lancet Commission for COVID-19 and the chair of the task force on workplace, school, and travel safety. And we have a, our first report coming out tomorrow. Before I jump into schools, I do want to talk about this wider conversation of workplace risk. I know this is the workplace group. and and, and I want to echo some of the comments Lydia said that a lot of this is new, but a lot of this is old as well. In fact, here's a commentary that Michael Waring and I wrote in, in the Journal of Exposure Science and Environmental Epidemiology in December, talking about the power of healthy buildings in pandemics. We knew one was going to hit. We didn't know what year it was going to be. We didn't know which type of uh, agent it would be, but we knew that buildings would play a key role whenever that time was, and we did not know it would be a couple months later. Uh, also been arguing for the case that buildings are the first line of defense and there are many control strategies. And really, I think like many in our field been trying to uh, communicate the science to the public in outlets like the New York Times and, and op-eds and uh, like Lydia's letter to the WHO with Don that we all signed to raise awareness of this. Importantly, I wanna, before I get into schools again, place the controls and engineering and ventilation controls in the bigger context of what we call the hierarchy of controls. And for those in worker health and safety, we'll see this flipped. We flipped this for this uh, report in Harvard Business Review, trying to bring the idea of hierarchy of controls and a layered defense strategy to the business community who has never quite seen this outside of the true industrial sector, talking about the five parts, elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. And all of them are gonna play a role in all three modes of transmission and help think about the control strategies we need to line up, the costs of those control strategies, and the prioritization that needs to be put in place. And you'll see healthy buildings and engineering controls right in the heart of the hierarchy of controls. Now, I wanna talk about uh, schools. That's what you invited me, me here to talk about. We've put out a lot of guidance on schools and we need to start with a bigger conversation of exposure and risk. In many cases, exposure and risk related to schools has gotten very reductionist. It's gotten very much down to the classroom and a specific mode of transmission. And that's all important, but more, or I'd say bigger, we have these massive costs associated with school closures. Virtual dropouts, I'll take where I am in Boston, 10,000 high school kids did not log in in the month of May, unaccounted for. Only half the elementary schools in Philadelphia, half of the elementary school students in Philadelphia log in on any given day. Virtual drop, dropouts therefore is critically important. Two, over 30 million people in the United States, kids rely on schools for food. So it's a food security issue. Kids who are at home are less physical active, socialization issues, uh, deficiencies in learning. And last, UNICEF says kids who are in lockdown are at greater risk for abuse, neglect, exploitation, and violence. So when we talk about exposure and risk, we need to take a really wide lens before we start thinking about what's actually happening in the classroom. There are severe consequences to keeping kids out of school. That's the why we need to get back to school. In terms of the who, 
very often the conversation is focused on kids, but I want to be clear that the risk reduction strategies I'm talking about and we'll talk about are focused on keeping both kids and adults safe in school. But when we do think about kids, we have to recognize a couple of things and these joint probabilities that exist. They are less likely to get infected than adults. That's a joint probability. Then as Lydia said, they're less likely to transmit. They can transmit, of course. They're less likely to. And her hypothesis there on uh, breath droplets, I think is outstanding. And I've cited that several times. On why they're less likely to get it could be, or some have proposed that it's due to fewer ACE2 receptors in the nasal or gene expression of the ACE2 receptor in the nasal cavity. Third and really important, if they do get it, kids are much less likely to suffer severe consequences. Lydia presented the case fatality rate. I really like the infection fatality rate where we actually have a good handle on the denominator. Some of the largest seroprevalence studies that have been conducted to date on kids, in fact, adults too, happened out of Europe. And just looking at the kid data, following several hundred thousand kids in a seroprevalence study, the risk of death after infection is on the order of 10 to the minus five risk. So th that data showed is about three and a hundred thousand risk, close to 10 to the minus five risk. Quite important, you see step functions in risk at age 20 to 50, where it gets 10 to the minus four, 50 to 70, 10 to the minus three, and then over 70, we've seen quite shocking uh, uh, percent level risk, infection fatality risk. Now, Two conditions precedent for reopening. So that is the backdrop of exposure risk. Two things need to be need to happen. Two conditions precedent. The first, we have to have low community spread. With several other colleagues at Harvard, uh, including Danielle Allen at the Harvard Center for Ethics and Ashish Jha at the Harvard Global Health Institute, who's now the dean at Brown University. He left as of September 1st, he left Harvard. Um, we put out a report detailing the metrics that can be used to determine when schools can be open safely. So that's a condition precedent first, low community spread. This is one of the metrics we are using, number of daily new cases per 100,000 people. We assign risk levels and then also assign what type of schools can be open, prioritizing the younger grades first. That's condition precedent one. Condition precedent two is it cannot be schools as usual. We have to change how we operate our schools. And here is the bulk of our 60 page report risk reduction strategies for reop reopening schools. I do want to point out everything I'm talking about. Several, we have five op-eds at this point. Uh, lots of tools for you I'll share at the end. Everything is at forhealth.org, F-O-R-Health.org. Or if you type Harvard Healthy Buildings, it should bring you to the forhealth.org website. We have a, a page dedicated to schools at schools.forhealth.org. And here you'll see this report authored by uh, many of uh, my, my team at the School of Public Health, engineers, postdocs, doctoral students, master's students that were released in June. We broke this down into five different categories uh, of, of uh, topics on where you can focus your interventions, policies, healthy activities, healthy schedules, healthy buildings, um, and healthy classrooms. I'm just going to talk about now the healthy buildings part of this to follow up on Lydia's work on airborne transmission. And here it's quite clear, right? Lydia laid this out nicely. There's really a couple different ways we're going to remove any airborne viral particles if we have an infector, a sick child or adult in the room, some from deposition, some from deposition in the lungs, and then either dilution through ventilation or air cleaning through filtration. And we like this as the hierarchy in thinking about your control strategies for airborne particles in the classroom. First, bring in more fresh outdoor air. If you have a central system, that's opening up your outdoor air dampers. If you have natural ventilation, making sure your central exhaust is working or windows open. We just released a study showing windows open a couple inches can greatly reduce uh, infiltration. Two, I mean, can increase infiltration of outdoor air and improve dilution. Then you should increase filtration, including the higher uh, grade filters in the recirculated air, and also consider supplemental filtration through the use of portable air cleaners. We like this as a quick remedy, knowing that the primary importance of getting kids back into school, and it's not going to be possible to retrofit all of our schools everywhere very quickly. So Rich Corsi and I uh, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post two or three weeks ago, outlining this as a strategy we would like schools in the US to take. 
In terms of the how-to, so we've been through the why, the who, the what, and now the how, we've released additional guidance to help people figure or help schools think about how they can go about measuring ventilation rates. And we tried to demystify this a bit. We wrote this with my longtime friend and mentor, Jack, Professor Jack Spangler, my doctoral student, Emily Jones, and postdoc uh, memo, Sedanio Lauren. And we put out a five-step guide to, to simplify this, and it gave schools a couple options for how to assess the ventilation rate, either using uh, CO2 tracing, CO2 decay curves, uh, or actually measuring with a bolometer and then giving action targets, right? So here's what we went out and did this in some actual schools. This is a bolometer or an airflow capture hood that measures airflow velocity, measuring the air intake coming, this in this case, through a unit ventilator outdoors. So you can actually quantify the ventilation rate. And in this set of pictures, we also quantified ventilation rate from opening windows. So the picture on the left is a bucket of dry ice. We had a fan, so we inc artificially increased CO2 concentrations, let that hit a steady state, opened up the windows, removed the source, of course, opened up the windows and measured decay curves to see the air, total air exchange rate. And we do that, we're able to create graphs like this for the different schools. And we outline this in the report to show you how you can do this in your own school to see what's the contribution or air exchange rate from mechanical ventilation, what contribution from windows open, and what happens when you have a door open. And of course, this varies based on pressurization. It can vary by time of day and across day. But it gives you a sense of what you can do in your school, but knowing this is only half of it. Then everybody had this question, well, what is the target air change per hour? So with Shelly Miller at Colorado University Boulder, we created a tool to help schools select a proper portable air cleaner. And in doing so, we, in that document, we set an air change per hour target for schools where we define four to five air changes is good, five to six is excellent, six is ideal, and recognizing that if you follow ASHRAE's minimum ventilation standards, you'll be at about three air changes per hour under uh, default occupant densities. All right, I'm gonna end there. I wanna leave you with a couple other things for uh, resources. Again, our website at the bottom is schools.forhealth.org. We have uh, tools for how to select a portable air cleaner, 20 questions every parent should ask before they send their kids back to school, links to when to open, the risk reduction strategy report, uh, a little more detailed technical guidance on portable air cleaners and, and the math behind it and why they work. And, um, and we hope it's a valuable resource and you'll, you'll share it widely. And I wanna thank uh, you for inviting me to present on this and, and share these tools, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Allen and Dr. Mrozka. Um, just before I open it up to questions, and I, and I just want to pose this question to both of you. Um, there's a lot of people on, on you know, th this webinar and also, you know, big number of our contacts are from, um, you know, developing economies. So if you think about, you know, the sort of like the schematic of the school that you've shown, um, Dr. Allen, and, you know, the thinking about around, um, you know, portable air cleaners and, you know, higher efficiency filters in recirculated air. I'm just wondering if, 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 if both of you would just maybe have some, share some of your thoughts about that, that we can share to those in developing, you know, countries and, you know, th key things that they might want to think about with their children going back to school. Maybe if I start with you, Dr. Allen, is that okay? Yeah, sure. So thanks. I think it's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, this is the challenge of, of, uh, of simplifying and distilling decades of science into actions the public can take, because then it gets really specific based on country, geography, uh, archetype of the school, seasonality effects. Um, the activities that take place in the school. But even so, it, we do need to present this guidance. And I think the takeaway <clears throat> for me, and I hope for others, is that uh, as we've talked to many schools around the world, that, that very often there are roadblocks put up. We can't do this for whatever reason. Uh, it's resources, we don't have this layout, we don't, but there's always something you can do to reduce risk. In fact, if you walk through this menu in the 60 page report, across all of these strategies, there are steps you can take in any school, under-resourced, over-resourced. Uh, and I, and I want to make sure, too, that we recognize, again, taking a larger view, it's not just the healthy building strategies. 
you think about these healthy schedules, it's staggering arrival times, it's de-densification strategies, it's not just physical distancing, but group distancing, so that if you have a case in the classroom, it doesn't spread throughout the entire school. It's universal masking, which all the models show that that's what's really gonna drive down risk. So there's always something you can do, and it's, it's beyond this conversation of ventilation and filtration. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Mareska, would you like to comment on that? Um, and maybe um, Dr. Oh, great, you've finished sharing your screen. Thanks, Joe. Well, very much what um, Joe said, uh, there's always something you can do as long as you are aware that something needs to be done. And this level of awareness is so low. It's so low in um, um, uh, low-income countries. It's so low in high-income countries. In Australia, if I mention this to anybody, just, uh, well, in a restaurant or our local church, ventilation, what? Uh, what's the, what is this, what the problem is? Awareness is absolutely the key issue and the first step for doing something. If you know that you need to do this and you know that this will protect you and your community and children, you will start thinking what to do. And then it uh, turns out that there are a lot of things you can do uh, in different settings. But if you don't know that this is a risk, uh, so it's always hazard identification. That's what I learned very early in the piece. And it was maybe this conversation we saw years and years ago that the, the, the workplace approach hazard identification. So thank you very much. And I'm just going to take the liberty and ask another question um, leading on from that. Um, and I know that you've like spoken a lot with the World Health Organization. And I've actually also been looking at the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization site myself to see if now there's a formal uh, recognition of aerosol transmission. And I know they did say that they were looking at it and you know that the evidence is, is emerging. Um, but do you know something that we don't know? Do you, do, are the World Health Organization going to now announce that they recognize the aerosol transmission group? Well, I wish I could say that I know something and that something is just about to happen. Uh, I don't. Uh, and I think uh, we still need to do some work talking more to the WHO colleagues to convince them. Um, basically, what we need, we need proper uh, guidelines, WHO guidelines, uh, which would put in a balanced way all three transmission modes and recommendations what to do. This is the most important document in the world, the most docu uh, the document the world needs, because this will open the door to all national actions. Without this document, it's always this, well, the WHO says this, but doesn't really say this. So that's I'll add one other thing from the US context, which is a, a big shift that has happened uh, recently. And, um, you know, I, many of us in the U.S. have talked to Dr. Fauci and uh, been pressing him on airborne transmission. And I will note that just this week or last week now at Harvard Medical School, he presented during the grand rounds. And it was the first time that I've seen on his slides that he talked about airborne transmission is happening. And he actually said this. Uh, uh, it's a credit to him. He says, it turns out we've been thinking about this incorrectly in the medical community. So um, it gives me some hope there that you have at least the top infectious disease expert in the United States talking about it. My hope is this translates into CDC guidance. I don't know if that will happen, but uh, hope there, the good news is that more people are talking about it and people of his stature are, are, are mentioning this. And that's a recent development. Yeah, absolutely. And just talking about hazard identification, you know, recognizing the hazard, acknowledging it. Thank you.